Okay, in the last class, we were discussing about this integral line of sight control or guidance law, where we were able to, we were, the idea was we wanted to remove these steady state offsets in the course angle chi caused by the kinematic modeling errors. And we saw that the typical way to do this would be to, instead of just having a proportional part uh, times the cross track error inside this tan inverse, we now bring in an additional term, which is the integral of the error over time, and we multiply by an integral gain, ki. Uh, kp is generally taken as 1 by the look ahead distance, so that is pretty much given. But then finding this value of ki is typically quite a challenging experience because we have to ensure that the system is stable and that it will always be stable for all the different conditions that we are expecting to see. So it's, fine, it's hard to find these optimal gains that satisfy the stability criterion for the system. So at least it is at that time we looked at an alternative representation where we looked at the idea that it is Kp times Yep, Ype plus Ki times a new variable we introduced called Yp in. And this yp int is no longer the integral as we had before, but it's also a it's a slowly varying integral term of sorts whose dynamics is now governed by this system right here. So yp int dot is actually equal to u times the cross track error divided by square root of look ahead distance square plus cross track error plus some design parameter k times yp int whole square. And the idea here is that this integral gain can now be figured out as some design parameter times the proportional gain, where k is greater than 0 is one of our design parameters. And that basically determines how this yp int varies. So how quickly or how slowly does this yp int vary is given by that. We looked at the dynamics of YPE by putting together everything, and then we tried to create a Lyapunov, candidate Lyapunov function uh, expressed as one half of YPE square plus K, K times one half of YP int square. And when we were able to substitute, take the derivative of this with respect to time and use the expression for YPE dot and YP int dot, we substitute these expressions into it and do some simplification. At the end of it, you should be getting something like this. And it is here that we made a slight error that this thing is always less than zero when YPE is not equal to zero. So therefore YPE equal to zero becomes a globally asymptotically stable system. But when I look at YPE and YP int together, you see that the invariant set is YPE equal to zero. No matter what is the value of YP int, the system will continue to stay there. Okay. So the idea is here that this statement that YPE and YP int equal to zero is globally asymptotically stable is not precisely correct in the strictest sense. YPE equal to zero is definitely globally asymptotically stable but yp int need not go to zero. yp int may be at a specific value. It may uh, asymptote to a non-zero value, which will account to account for the disturbances in our system. Okay, So the global asymptotic stability is really there for the cross-track error. That definitely does go back to zero, but it doesn't necessarily ensure that yp int will go back to zero. And I think that is where the slight error was there yesterday. Okay. All, right. All right. So progressing further, is, is there any other questions up till this point? Um, sir, I have a slight doubt actually. Yes. Uh, regarding the value of YP int, um, so in that case, uh, for a particular system, yeah, suppose we have that wind conditions. So uh in even in that case also we require a specific value of yp in such that it com it uh, compensates for that uh, wind condition right okay. but um, 
this condition, this uh, uh, globally asymptotic system, uh, uh, in that case, uh, uh, stable, but uh, in that case, it doesn't uh, actually make it converge to a specific value of yp in, right? It, for yeah, it, it will not converge to yp in t equal to zero. Like, yeah, if, if, if for a non-zero value also, it doesn't actually make it converge to a specific non-zero value, right? For any value of yp in, it, it actually, um, uh, yeah, it actually remains stable in that position. So, yes. Um, it can can we be sure that it will actually con uh, stay at a value of yp in such that it will exactly compensate the win conditions? I come again. I think what you mean is if, tell me if my question is right. You're saying that how do I know that yp in doesn't keep wandering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, basically, how how do we know that it will exactly stay ah, in the area of YPE? That is precisely known because if you look at the dynamics here, when YPE is zero, mm -hmm. YPE int dot will definitely be zero. So it will stay at whatever value it was. Okay. It cannot wander in time. Okay, yeah. that will. So YPE will definitely go to zero. Mm -hmm. YPE int will definitely approach some value, and it will stay at that value. Okay. That's now, that value may be arbitrary at, as of now as to where it will settle down depends on how much external disturbance I have in the system. But yp int will definitely not be wandering around. Okay. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other queries? Sir. Yeah. Sir, can you go to that last equ equation link? Yeah that v dot less than zero so yeah. basically we told we told that uh, it is globally asymptotically stable right this correct so uh, probably uh, only one equilibrium point should be there right for a system to be globally asymptotically stable correct so here it is not one equilibrium point it's the entire line right wherever yes. my ype is equal to zero so any YPE and YP int. As long as this is equal to zero comma anything, where A can be any real number, right? So long as that is the case, it will always it will always converge to that equilibrium set. Okay. Right. And so no matter what happens, okay, YP int may not be stabilizing to zero in this case, but at least YPE will definitely stabilize to zero. You're getting my point. The problem will lay in the last time when I was saying that Y zero comma zero is not the only equilibrium point which is invariant. That is what is the key. Here, because of the way that we have chosen the dynamics of YP int, when YPE is zero, YP int dot will also be zero. So therefore, whatever value that yp int is at, it continues to be at that value, right? So the equilibrium point is not a single equilibrium point of 0, 0, but it is 0, a, where a can be any real line, a can be any real number. So if there's a perturbation, uh, it will go to another equilibrium point. Correct. So if I change ype, then I will settle down to a new equilibrium point, which will again come back to the same set, 0, a. It may come, up, come back to a different point, 0, b, it doesn't matter, but it will definitely be on that line. So if I am looking at, let's say, the plot of, if I want to see uh, ype, and let's say yp int. So it, sees, it means that I'm actually on this x-axis. And if I perturb the system anywhere, it may come back to a different location of YP int, but it will always come back to the zero value of YPE. YPE will always be zero. Is that making sense? Um, excuse me, sir. Uh, so this raised a question for me. So, uh, for a particular system, for a particular wind condition, Shouldn't there be a fixed value of YP in 
such that yes, can... no, but here i am saying i'll perturb it further and then let it go uh, but even then and converges back to that uh, equilibrium position it is still the same external conditions right it can be by right? so in that no, case, i meant the perturbation i meant that the wind condition has changed let us say okay in that so let sense, us say yeah, that the wind condition was 1 meter, 10 meters per second and now suddenly it became 12 meters per second okay fine yeah it then will settle yeah. down to a new equilibrium point that's what okay. i mean yeah yeah, yeah. then it will be gone. yes that is true okay that's all I, if it is back if the wind comes back to 10 meters per second you are right that it will settle back to its old value of wherever okay. it is okay yeah that's true okay all right any other queries so if uh, consider the equilibrium point is zero so both cases also will be considered as the GA, sir. GA, sir, right? Sorry, I couldn't hear you clearly, Krishna. Hello. Come again. Sorry, if we have, if have, if have the two equilibrium points, so one is 0, 0, and one is 0, 8. So both cases also mm -hmm. will become a globally asymptotic right? Yeah, basically, that no, that invariant set in globally asymptotically stable. Which means no matter where you start, you will reach that your trajectories will always end up on that invariant set, which is in this case that real line, that x axis on this plot which you see. The system will always come back, so no matter where I start, it will always come back and it will settle down on some point. Actually, it cannot do that actually. It has to come back and settle down straight away here. Okay. It will asymptotically stabilize. It can't cross and come back. Okay, Because if it crosses at one point, it has to stay on that line forever. So it can't suddenly shoot out. It violates that principle. Okay, So it will all... Basically, this means that no matter where I start, my YPE will definitely go to zero. YPE yield may not go to zero. That's all. Depending on the environmental condition. If I have no environmental conditions, if I have don't have any wind or anything like that, I should expect this one also to probably go to zero. Because I don't need to contract anything at that place. Okay. All right. Yeah, so that little confusion here is definitely there. So the notes do need to be edited. This statement is not precisely correct. So we'll, we'll change that and probably re-upload the notes in a couple of days, okay? All right, now let's try to look at a guidance loss for path following using heading autopilots. So, so far we were looking at course autopilots, which means that we were trying to figure out this desired course angle and we wanted to make sure that our craft tries to follow that desired course angle and we were using line of sight methodologies to determine this desired course angle. But many a times we may not know the course angle precisely, but we definitely would know the heading angle precisely in the sense that I may not know if I have my ship, okay, I may not know my precise estimate of my velocity, but I'll definitely know precise estimate of my heading, of how the bow of the ship is pointed towards. Typically, you will get that using a compass. Easiest way is through compass. You put a compass, you know with respect to north direction, what is the angle at which you are moving. Right? But the velocity vector, what it is, the angle it is making with respect to the north direction, cannot so easily be calculated unless you have other sensors, like a GPS sensor or things like that, where you are getting estimates for velocity. Only then you can precisely get it. And the other thing is course angle is only defined when we have non-zero speed. Right? Because course angle is basically saying velocity vector versus the north direction. If velocity vector is zero, then what am I defining the angle with respect to becomes questionable. Right? So in such cases, it might be more useful to actually look at it from a point of view of heading controller rather than a course angle control and that is the idea which we will mostly be looking at today. We know that this course angle is nothing but the heading angle plus this value of beta c 
and this beta c is nothing but what we call as the crab angle. And we know that this angle is actually sine inverse of minus V by capital U or equivalently it is tan inverse of small v by small u. Right? We have seen this angle before. And that is the difference between the, so basically this is the angle between the longitudinal direction of the ship to the velocity vector and psi is the angle of between the north direction to the longitudinal direction of the ship. So that's why you see uh, psi plus beta c will give you your course angle which is given by i. All right. Yeah, as I said, both these values, crab angle beta c and the course angle chi, are not defined when we have a zero speed problem. However, the heading angle psi or the yaw angle is well defined both for zero and forward speed. So therefore, it might be better to specify guidance in terms of a desired heading angle rather than in terms of a desired course angle. Many a times it might be more uh, making more sense to mariners who are actually sailing that if I tell them, okay, your heading should be so and so, it is much more easier and more intuitive to understand rather than telling them, hey, your course angle must be so and so. Because velocity is something which you can't directly see, but heading is something which you can directly observe off of a compass. So if we look at what should be the desired heading angle, given that I know a desired course angle, then it is simply desired course angle minus beta c. We are just rearranging that old equation. And we saw that this head course angle in our LOS guidance scheme, proportional LOS guidance scheme, we are taking that as pi e minus tan inverse of kp times ype. And then I simply have this additional term minus beta c in there in order to do the heading angle calculation. Now, the craft can be controlled using a typical heading autopilot. So generally what happens is we want to look at a uh, vector or a thrust or a what you call moment which is provided by minus kp times psi, uh, psi tilde minus kd psi times psi tilde dot minus ki psi times integral 0 to t k psi tilde tau d tau. And what here I mean by psi tilde is the difference between the angle psi, the actual heading angle, and the desired heading angle. So I'm here talking about a controller, okay? I'm not talking about the guidance part per se here. I'm talking about the controller. It's a typical PID controller. So this being the I term, this being the D term, and this being the C term. And if we know the crab angle beta c precisely, which means if we have the velocity measurements properly, then we can actually look at what is the value of beta c in terms of u and v, and I can actually compensate for that and provide my desired psi as pi p minus tan inverse of kp times y p e minus sine inverse of this quantity. So notice here that what is happening is our heading autopilot is now here, which is missing. The heading and autopilot is actually measuring the compass measurements rather than the course over ground. And many a times this is much more easily available. So it's more of a practical consideration that I would rather want to deal with the heading angle rather than the course angle. Okay, so small offsets can still be observed in the steady state even though beta c is compensated for and we, so the idea is when I implement this guidance law, I can still see that there is some small offsets which will be observed in a steady state state, even though we are actually accounting for beta c. So we are actually taking into account for this value as well, but still my controller may not be reaching a steady state value. And that might be because of things like kinematic coupling in roll and pitch, because I'm not looking at a six degree of freedom model in this case, I'm basing it off of a three degree of model case. So when I have some cross coupling happening, I can see that the value of the psi may not settle down at psi d precisely. There may be some steady state errors which may still be left out. 
Now, typically we would like to overcome this using the integral action, just like as we saw for the uh, course angle case as well, where any offset in the error is there in the steady state scenario, we would like to include an integral term into our controller so that we can compensate for it. So the same we can do for integral line of sight using a heading autopilot as well. The main advantage, as I said, is when no velocity measurements are available to approximate beta c. What we can do is we can simply say psi d is pi p minus tan inverse of kp times y p e plus ki times integral 0 to t and integral term that I have added. Notice here that you might be wondering what happened to the beta c. I have not subtracted that beta c. The idea here is that I do not know precisely what that beta c is when velocity measurements are not available. So it is treated as a disturbance in itself and our controller is basically trying to compensate for that as well in order to see if our heading angle can simply track down to the value of pi t. Okay. That's what it's basically trying to do. Again, as I said, this value, this type of a control law requires this ki to be determined and it's not very easy to determine this ki because we can't necessarily prove stability for this system. So in many cases we might want to be uh, careful about the, the design effects of what is happening with ki. So we should make sure that the overshooting is not a big problem or the integral wind up should not be a big problem. Typically what happens is when I change the set point, so let us say I was tracking certain uh, some waypoint from one, on one waypoint to here. So let's say that I'm going from here to here. Okay, and then the next waypoint I'm changing from there to there. So my set point value is changing. So my psi D value is undergoing a large change the moment I reach one waypoint and I start moving towards the other waypoint. When I see such a large change in psi d or a set point, what happens is the controller actually has to slowly try to compensate and then come back onto this track, right? And as it does that, this integral term which we have here, that starts to accumulate a good lot of amount of error, right? So that error is not zero and it starts becoming bigger. That integral of ype times dt starts becoming bigger. And when, once it becomes bigger, what happens is this is a large value sitting there in terms of the uh, value of psi d. So it makes my controller a little bit more finicky in the sense that uh, when, when I try to overshoot, so when I try to go back out, okay, so let us say that, yeah, let me say, choose a different color. So I was coming this way, okay, and then I had an overshoot and then I have to try to come back to this track. So this overshoot really depends on how big this error is. So how long does the system take for me to actually respond back will depend on how much of a wind up I have in this integral term. So depending on how, how big this term has become over the change of the course will determine how sensitive the system is. So this sort of a problem causes a lot of overshooting. So the overshooting can be becoming larger and larger. So if I have a next waypoint, I may see a much larger overshoot in this case, which may start now building up as I keep changing my set points. Okay, that is what is called as an integral wind up. In the sense that when I change the set point from one waypoint to the next waypoint, there is an error which gets accumulated into the integral term. And that may cause my system to exhibit large overshoots for further set points. Is everybody with me so far on this? I don't understand this. So once you start from one waypoint and you come here, you have a small overshoot, let's say, let's say you have an overshoot one. Okay. And then you change course again. Now you see a overshoot two. I'm saying that this overshoot start becoming bigger and bigger as I keep changing the waypoints because with each time I change the set point. So in this case, the heading angle was, let's say with respect to the north, 60 degrees. Okay, let's say here it was 120 degrees. Okay, so I made a 60 degree change in the heading angle. 
when I reached the second waypoint, right? And when I suddenly made that change, the system had to take some time to adapt itself and get back onto the track. That's why you see that first overshoot happen, right? And when that first overshoot happened, over that time, the cross-track error was quite large. And we integrated over that cross-track error over time, so our integral term now became much bigger. Right? So therefore, what happened? Now when I came to the next overshoot, the next point, my waypoint change, it resulted in a much larger overshoots. Because of the integral term being big. And this keeps building up, right? So that is called integral wind up in SOFT. And we have to be very careful about that. And the main idea of this integral wind up is it will lead to large overshoot values. Progressively, as I go uh, further and further with waypoints, I will start seeing much bigger overshoots come up. And we have to be careful that that should not be the case, right? Then the controller is not doing its job properly after a certain time. We want overshoots to be as low as possible. So can't we change that k value to be smaller? Correct, but we are not doing an adaptive controller here, no? Here we are actually talking about a fixed value gains, where the gains have been fixed or tuned and fixed up. But over time, this wind up problem is causing me to go haywire. Right? So it, it is important to choose that ki value in a such a way that this wind up should not increase by too much. And it is hard problem to find. So what I'm trying to tell you is this finding of this ki value, an optimal value of this ki is not so easy. Which is why we will see that we will look at this alternate approach again, where we use this idea of yp int. There we are more confident of the things because we can prove stability of what the system. Whereas here proving stability is much more harder. Okay, with that yp int formulation, we can actually show that the system is globally asymptotically stable, resulting in the required properties that we want. Okay. So that is why we will choose this nonlinear controller again, where you'll see the same idea as before, only that instead of the course angle, now I have the heading angle put up here. Again, the beta C part is missing here because that also is taken into account as a disturbance of the system. Because we are not presuming that we have proper measurements of velocity in order to estimate the value of beta C. If we had proper velocity estimates, and we wanted to compensate for that beta c, we would simply add that term here. We'll simply say minus beta c. Okay. I don't know whether it was minus or was it plus. Yeah, minus beta c. Okay. So you would end up with a term which was having minus beta c. Now, where this yp int is following the same procedure as before, and then you can actually show that uh, the same properties hold as we saw in the last time as well, system properties remain to be the same. And again, we can show that yp equal to zero will be guaranteed in a globally asymptotic sense. Okay. Same procedure applies here as well. The idea here though is that if you look at YPE, okay, when YPE increases, when this value is large, okay, when this value is large, the influence of the integrator diminishes. One second, I'm missing a square root here, am I not? One second. I am missing a square root there. Goodness gracious. There should be a square root here. Yeah. All right. So when YPE is large, what will happen? When the 
cross track error is large what is happening go to delta you saturate yeah the ype int actually saturates to a certain value called delta it can't go any bigger than that right? so there so there is some limiting factor so some saturation is available for our ype int in this formulation which may not necessarily be available in the previous formulation where we are simply looking at this this formulation there there is no limitation on what that value will become okay. at least here we have some bound on yp int and this actually guarantees us that the cho choice of the dynamics guarantees us that the ype will tend to zero over time as t tends to infinity so that guarantee is what we are hedging our bets on. It is for that reason why, in, why we are ready to introduce this more complex system into the place so that we can get a guarantee on the YP. All right. So therefore, since the effect of the influence of the integrator kind of is uh, getting to some saturation, so YP int dot is approximately becoming delta, you'll see that this integral wind up risk, which we were facing with our first one, is a little reduced with this system. But again, we still have to be a little careful wherever we are using these integral gains. One has to be a little careful about them. More on this probably will be clearer when we try to set up an assignment on this and try to actually see this in action. Then we'll try to appreciate more as to what is going on with these integral gains. Okay, all right. So with that, we have kind of looked at uh, trajectory tracking problem initially, then we lo looked at the point of view of target tracking, and then we talked about path following using waypoints, right? Where waypoints, we were, we were typically looking at waypoints, which are representing straight line paths. But now we will try to understand what happens when we have curved paths. How does the things change or how does our guidance loss, do they really undergo a change or can we still continue to use the same guidance loss, especially for path following problems when we have a uh, curved path in there. Similarly, also the second part which we want to find out is suppose I have given a few waypoints, how do I actually find a curved path which is good enough or how do I do the fitting between them and we look at one or two approaches as to how that can be performed. And even in the assignments, we'll try to have a system where we will try to see what is happening to this uh, uh, different ways to find the path between the waypoints. Okay, so when, whenever we are talking about curved path following, we are relaxing the condition that the path consists of straight lines. So now our path is no longer a straight line. And we are trying to design, we are assuming that the kinematic controller uh, is present for our guidance system that uses an a priori known parameterization of the path. I'll come to this a little bit in, in just a second here. Okay. So what I mean by a parameterized path is that I'm looking at a geometric curve which is depending on some path variable. Okay. And this path variable need not always have a physical definition all the time. Okay. This path variable could be time in which case the problem simply becomes target tracking or tra trajectory tracking problem. If it is not time, it could be something in terms of path length, arc length, or it could be something that I just made up. Okay. As long as I am looking at a path which is parameterized in terms of some parameter, some continuous path variable omega, I call that a parameterized path. Is everybody with me here? So when I'm talking about here, uh, eta d, the desired uh, position of the vessel, I may be looking at x desired, y desired, and even I may look at psi desired. Okay. For a surface graph, those would be the three more uh, conventional variables which one would be interested in. But on the other hand, let's say that I'm interested in an underwater vehicle. I might actually be interested in XYZ coordinates of the points that are my waypoints, which I have to necessarily pass my path through. So a geometric curve 
where it is depending on some continuous function of this variable or continuous path variable is what is called as a parameterized path. For a typical surface graph, you'll see that we typically choose to parameterize the path with respect to the x, y positions. We are more interested in a path which will go through different waypoints which are located with it, which are provided to us with a latitude and a longitude, let's say. Right? So we are mostly looking at a system where x desired and y desired is provided us to us with a parametric path, a parameterized path width. Now, we define a few quantities. I define this quantity Pn prime, okay, is the first derivative of Pn, which means it is the first derivative of the position with respect to the path variable. Pn double prime represents the second derivative of the path with respect to the variable omega prime, okay, omega prime. The idea here is that simply making a distinction between p dot and p prime. Notice that whenever I say a dot, I am talking about a time derivative. Okay. Whenever I'm saying a prime, I'm talking about a path based variable, a derivative with respect to a path based variable. Is that making sense? It's just a convention that I'm making there. Yes, Anand? No, sir, I understood. Understood. All right. Okay. All right. So then our task basically is uh, to look at the maneuvering problem of the craft and it can be decomposed into two parts. So the first part is that we want to force the current position of the vehicle to converge to the desired position on the path. Okay. As time tends to infinity, I want my vehicle to be on the desired path for any continuous function of this path uh, variable omega prime. Now, the dynamic part is that I want to force the speed omega dot to converge to the desired speed ub according to this law. Okay. How am I getting that? I'm actually getting that by the idea that the desired speed of the vehicle is nothing but the rate of change of the path with respect to time in x plus rate of change of path with respect to time along the y, square them and add them up, that gives me the actual desired velocity. Right? Now I can express that in terms of path variable derivatives as shown here. Yes? And that is why I am kind of saying that my dynamic task is to make sure that this omega prime tracks ud by square root of xd prime square plus yd prime square. And that's simply coming by rearranging this, this equation here. Okay, I'm just taking this term, dividing it here. That's all. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, so it's basically uh, spare, dividing it into two parts. One is the geometrical problem where I want my craft to be on the same path as what I have prescribed it to be. And the second is the dynamic task where I want, where I'm starting to talk about what is happening to the speed and other things. Okay. Here I want my uh, time derivative of that path variable to coincide with this desired speed of the vehicle. Okay. All right. Now you might be observing this and wondering what happens if dot equal to one and omega of zero is equal to zero. Then it simply turns out that omega is nothing but time, right? In this particular case, the path following problem has changed into a target trajectory tracking problem, isn't it? So the path is no longer parameterized in terms of some path variable. The path variable is nothing but time itself. Okay. So you can think of this as a special case of path following problems, especially in the curved cases where omega dot is equal to one or this omega bar dot is equal to one and omega of zero is equal to zero gives me that it actually is parameterized with respect to the time. Okay, 
Now the next part is how to generate a path through interpolation methods. So suppose I am given a couple of waypoints. How do I make a path? So suppose I have given a few waypoints, the user has specified, okay, I need to visit site A, site B, site C, site D. What is the best path? How do I form a path, a smooth enough path between these four points? And that is where we typically use interpolation methods. And MATLAB has very strong interpolation methods, which you probably must be knowing. A couple of them are mentioned here. One is the spline, and the other is what is called as pitching. Okay. So you can actually go into MATLAB and type help. Spline or help pitching. And you'll see that both of them are different methodologies for fitting a smooth curve through a given set of points. It will try to interpolate between them and give you a smooth set of points. But there are some differences between them. So I just wanted to cover what are the major differences between them. So with the spline, what happens is you're looking at these second order derivatives at the endpoints of the polynomial. And you're trying to say that they are actually going to be equal. So between one waypoint to the other waypoint to the third waypoint as the path goes along. Okay, at this waypoint, I want to see that the second derivatives from this side and the second derivatives from this side, they both match up. Okay, that is what it is trying to do when I say I'm using a split. Because it is trying to match the second derivatives, it is a much smoother curve that you'll get out of this. But again, the problem with it is that you can sometimes see a good amount of overshoots. Okay, because stricter tangency brings into consideration larger overshoots. Okay. Whereas the other methodology, the speech chip, it is using Hermite polynomials, so Hermite interpolating polynomials, where the idea is that we want to make sure that the first order derivatives are continuous. So I'm trying to match the first order derivatives from both sides of the waypoints. Okay. So here I'm not making a consideration that the second order derivative should match. So it is relaxing that condition a little, little bit. So you'll see that the overshoots are a little less, but the slopes are chosen such that the, that the shape is preserved. So we are ensuring that your, your interpolating line actually passes through the waypoints, but we are not ensuring that a second order tangency is met. Okay. So the second derivatives are not going to be matched. So you're not going to see a very smooth curve come out of it. And it caters to data which is not very smooth. Okay. So a data points which are generated not out of a smooth function can be fit effectively using pitching. Whereas if the data points were actually representing a very smooth function, you might want to use spline in that. So spline is better than p chip if the data values are of a smooth function. So if they represent something of a very smooth function, then spline is better. But if the data is non-smooth, is not very smooth, then p chip will give you a very few oscillations as compared to spline. So a typical example might look like this. So suppose this, I have these five points which I want to interpolate between. So this is point number one, two, three, four and five. You'll see that the spline is the one which has high amounts of overshoot because it wants to match the second derivatives at points two, three, four, and five. Okay. Whereas the P chip is only trying to match the first derivatives. So it is not caring so much about the second derivatives. So it is able to do a much better job for a non-smooth data. So this would be more, more indicative of what would be a non-smooth data. Okay. But in the, on the other hand, if my waypoints were actually coming through a very smooth data point, then a spline would do a better fit than what I would get out of pitch. So these are just two of the methodologies which are available to us in the MATLAB toolbox. But next time what we are going to do is we are going to take a look at an interpolation method, okay, which is an alternative to the spline and the pitch, where we are taking as an the desired trajectory in X and Y as a 
polynomial in the path variable omega prime, omega bar. So unlike taking them to be a, uh, what do you call, we are, on, instead of using Hermite polynomials or cubic polynomials, we are taking it, we are taking the parameterized path in terms of the path variable. And then we'll try to figure out what these coefficients should be such that I get a smooth curve between the, all the waypoints that I want to look at. We'll in fact look at a math of it and probably in your assignment, I'll make sure that a problem comes up on this where you can actually program this and see for yourself. Okay, so we'll spend the next lecture most likely on trying to figure out how to uh, uh, do this part. But maybe I can actually go a little further. We can spend some basics can be covered today. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. Okay, so let's say that our path variable is omega bar, and then I parameterize my path in terms of cubic variables in x and y as shown here. Now, the derivative with respect to the path variable is simply given by taking the derivative here. So you see that this becomes 3a3 times omega square plus 2a2 times omega plus a1. So I think this is pretty straightforward to follow. Now, the time derivative of this uh, trajectory is actually given by the path derivatives which we saw before multiplied by this omega dot where I'm basically using the chain rule of differentiation that's all I'm doing here right the derivative with respect to time is equal to derivative with respect to the path variable times the derivative of omega bar with respect to t so it's simply a chain rule being applied here similarly for the y yd dot as well. Now, I know that using yd dot and xd dot, I can actually find out what is my desired velocity as a function of this variable, path variable, w bar or omega bar. And I can see that it is nothing but uh, this thing, which we have seen before, right? It's, it's the same expression what we saw before, no different than that. Okay, so let us say that I have n points, okay? So n plus one points. So I have zero, so x zero, y zero, x one, y one, x two, y two, some other point x three, y three, and so on and so forth, up to x n, y n. So I want to find an interpolating polynomial between these four, these all these n points that I have, n plus one points that I have, okay? And the idea here is that the path through any two way points, so which goes through x k minus one comma y k minus one and x k comma y k must satisfy that when the path variable is equal to omega bar k minus one, the value should be xk minus one and the path variable is omega k minus one on the yd it should be yk minus one similarly when the path variable is omega bar k the value should be xk and yk so what i'm intending here is the left hand side denotes the uh, value of the path which i get from the interpolating polynomial and the left hand the right hand side is denoting what are the actual waypoints which i had given to the system so the interpolating polynomial should definitely satisfy that it should pass through these points at those prescribed times. Everybody with me so far? Yes, I'm seeing some confusion there. Aditya on your face. No, sir. Everything fine? Yes. Okay, all right. Now, Similarly, we also need to ensure that a smoothness is there. So which means that the slope must be matched from either side. So the slope from when I try to approach omega k from the left hand side and when I try to approach omega k from the right hand side, the slope values must be the same. Okay, so both in x as well as in y. Now, we also need to add two boundary conditions and you'll see that these boundary conditions can be specified as velocities at the starting point and the ending point or accelerations at the starting and the ending point. Okay? So 
so they can either be the velocities are specified at the starting and the ending or the accelerations are specified at the starting and the ending point. So the idea here now becomes that the polynomial xd, which is parameterized with respect to omega k, is given by parameters a3k, a2k, a1k, a0k coefficients, which are getting multiplied by omega k cube, omega k square, omega k, and unity. Right? So I'm looking at a cubic polynomial, which I want to look at. So I want to find out these coefficients as it passes through these different points. So notice that here I have n times, uh, four times n minus one unknowns, which means I want to find out, except for the starting and the ending point, which is zero and n, there are n minus one points in between. Correct? Everybody with me? I have points starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up till n. So the number of points in between are n minus 1. Except for the boundary points, I have n minus 1 points. For each of those n minus 1 points, I have an interpolating polynomial, a cubic polynomial, which will have four coefficients which I want to look at. Okay? So therefore, how many unknowns I have? Four times n minus one. Okay. The only thing is now I also need to make sure that it satisfies all the constraints which I have laid out before. That it should satisfy the smoothness constraints. It should satisfy the fact that it should actually pass through the points. Those need to be satisfied. And then I need to find values of AK such that those conditions are satisfied. So I need to find out these n four times n minus one coefficients such that my path smoothly passes through these different n waypoints which I have specified. Okay. All right. So my unknowns can all be put together as is vector x, as a column vector x, where I have a1, a2, a3 up to a n minus one, all stacked together one next to the other. Okay. Now, I want to make sure, I want to set up the problem as a linear system of equations where I'm looking at sum y is equal to some matrix A times x. Okay? And this matrix A times x is equal to y will actually come from all our constraints that we have formulated. Okay, At the end of it, I'll invert A and multiply with y and I'll get what is the value of these coefficients A's that I need to use in order to find the interpolating polynomial. Everybody with me so far? Yes? Okay, so let's start. So this y vector, which is on the left-hand side, will look something like this. So I'm assuming something like this. Bear with me here, and I'll show you how this is actually representing all the constraints which we have laid out. So the first one, the first vector will be x start, which will either be the velocity or the acceleration, depending on which one we chose for the problem, at the zeroth waypoint. Okay. The next point will be the waypoint, zeroth waypoints x coordinates, waypoint at x1, waypoint at x1, 0, 0, waypoint at x2, waypoint at x2, 0, 0. Again, we, we follow the same pattern x3, x3, 0, 0, x4, x4, 0, 0, up till we come to xn, and then we finally end with xn final. Okay, where xn final again represents either the velocity or the acceleration at the last waypoint, depending on how we chose to specify it. Okay, now what is this A matrix? That is what will determine how well this thing is looking at. Okay, so now we'll, we'll start with the first one. So each of the constraints we'll start with. The first constraint is we want to satisfy that, uh, what you call, our values of that velocity or uh, acceleration, which were specified at the zeroth point. 
must be equal to the values which are specified. The specified value is given in y, right? That is x star. Yes? That must be equal to when I substitute in my polynomial omega bar 0. I should get the same thing. Correct? So you'll see that this c star is nothing actually but the value of the velocity or the acceleration depending on uh, which one was chosen evaluated at omega bar zero okay that times the polynomials coefficients should give me the value of x zero prime or x zero double prime similarly the next one you saw here was the waypoint at zero so that is nothing but the position vector p of omega zero, which is nothing but omega cube, omega square, omega times one. So this, when multiplied with the first polynomial's four coefficients, will give me the value of that polynomial at omega zero. this particular one. Everybody with me? Yes, no? Is that making sense? Right, again, good. See, this matrix I'm multiplying by uh, the matrix of A's, right? K0, uh, what was it called? Yeah, A30. Okay. So A30, no, sorry, A31, A, A21, A11, A01, followed by A32. A22, A12, A02, so on and so forth. Where I am looking at the polynomial that I am looking at is A31 times omega bar cubed plus A32 times omega bar square plus A31 times omega bar plus A30. This is what I have. Sorry. No, I made a mistake here. This should be two one. Sorry. This is a two one. Uh, one one and zero one. Yeah. This is the value of x d at omega bar. When it is between the points x0, y0 and x1, y1, let's say, okay, between these two points, this polynomial, this cubic polynomial represents the value of x desired along the path, okay, but when I move to the next waypoint between x1, y1 and x2, y2, This thing is given by A32 omega bar cube plus A3 A22 omega bar square plus A12 plus A02. This represents the value of the XB whenever it lies between these two points. Each of these paths is getting parametrized. Okay. Our task is to find all these coefficients such that they satisfy all the constraints of the problem. Such that they satisfy the constraints that when I substitute 
omega bar is equal to omega bar 1 into this equation and into this equation I should get the same value which should be x1. Is everybody following me? Krishna Velu, are you following me? Yes, sir, but not clear, sir. Lots of lots of people. See, think about it this way. Okay. I have point number one, which is x0, y0. Okay. Point number one, x1, y1. Point number two, x2, y2. And so on and so forth. Okay. So I have x3, y3, and so on and so forth. I'm saying that I have a path which I'm following, a smooth curve through these waypoints which is looking like this. I want to get a parametric equation for this curve. A piecewise cubic polynomial is what I want to specify that as. This, the x value on this is given by some path variable, which is varying along this values. So let us say that this point corresponds to omega bar equal to zero. Let's say this point comes, corresponds to omega bar equal to 1. This point corresponds to omega bar equal to 2. This point corresponds to omega bar equal to 3. So on and so forth. Okay. Simplest example. Okay. Now, what I am saying is between x0 and x0, y0 and x1, y1, x of b will vary as a3, 1, omega bar cube plus a21 omega bar square plus a11 omega bar plus a01. This is the polynomial which will represent the curve from x0, y0 till x1, y1. Okay. In fact, it will in fact it will represent probably the curve from x0, y0 till x2, y2. Okay. Because we will see that uh, we want to see that uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, up to x0, x1, y1. Yeah, that is fine. Now, this side of the curve between x1, y1 and x2, y2 is represented by another polynomial which is given by xd of omega bar is equal to a32 omega bar cube plus a22 omega bar square plus a12 omega bar plus a02. This cubic polynomial represents the polynomial in this range between x1, y1 and x2, y2. Okay. I want to make sure that all the constraints of the problem are satisfied. What are our constraints? That it should pass through here, right? So when I substitute xd of 1 from this equation must equal to xd of 1 from this equation. They both should give me the same value because it is going to be at the same x, right? It corresponds to the same point which will be to x1, y1. It will be at this point. So that constraint must be satisfied, yes? Yes, sir. Yes, Krishna Velu, is that making sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, similarly, the slope also must be satisfied. So x d prime at 1 must equal to x d prime at 1, where this fellow is calculated using this. And this fellow is calculated using this. They both must be satisfied. But all of these constraints, I want to find out or I want to evaluate them together. Okay. All these constraints, I want to put them together in one single matrix equation so that I can solve for these A values at once. So rather than solving for these values individually, I want to solve for all of these values at once. 
So which is why I am setting up this so-called matrix equation and I am trying to figure out what is happening there. So for example, let us say when it comes to this matrix term, it is getting multiplied by these values, right? This one is getting multiplied by this one. This one is getting multiplied by this one. Correct? Right? What do I have on the right hand side on Y? We'll see here. On the Y, I have X1 and X1. Okay, both of them are X1. But one of them is evaluated using a polynomial which is fitting the first the, between x0 and between x0 and x1. What is the interpolating polynomial? What is its value at this point? The other one is telling me what is the interpolating polynomial between x1 and x2 evaluated at x1. This one is telling me when it gets multiplied by this is giving me this equation, this top equation. Whereas this one, when multiplied by the second part, is giving me this second equation. And both of them must be equal to x1. That is what I am expressing here, no? That is why I have x1 on the right hand side. Both of them is x1. So it is the same constraint, but I'm writing it in a matrix form. Yes, making sense now? Everybody? Yes? Okay. Same thing I'm doing here as well. See, for example, when I say these terms are zeros, I am looking at the this value multiplied by 1 and this value multiplied by 2 and added together must be 0. What is this V of W1? V of W1 is the derivative basically. It's taking as basically the velocity at the point x1, y1 evaluated from the polynomial on the left hand side evaluated from the polynomial on the right hand side when they are added together must give zero. That is what it is saying. That the slope is continuous. Okay. Similarly, the last one is saying that the acceleration from the left hand side and the acceleration from the right hand side when multiplied and evaluated from the polynomial to the left and the polynomial to the right yield the same value at that waypoint. Okay. Similar constraints will now be formulated for the second waypoint. So this one represented for the first waypoint. These are the constraints at x1, y1. The next set will introduce the constraints at x2, y2. When I do the constraints at x2, y2, I am looking at this polynomial, the second one, and then that next polynomial. That's why you will see that the first column here is all zeros. Is that making sense? Okay, because I am now looking at the position value from the second polynomial must equal to the position value from the third polynomial. Okay, similarly the velocity from the second polynomial must equal the velocity from the third polynomial. Acceleration from the second polynomial must equal to the acceleration from the third polynomial. So this cascadingly it will move down. This matrix will basically be a cascading matrix which will copy itself in some sense as it moves down. Okay, and this entire matrix when multiplied by these coefficients 
is giving me this vector value y, which I have specified here. It, it's just all the constraints of the problem specified in matrix format so that I can evaluate the coefficients at once. Okay, I simply now take a inverse times y and that will give me all the coefficients at once in such a manner that all the constraints are satisfied. Okay, that's all I'm doing here. And by doing this exercise, I'm simply calculating x as a inverse y and that simply will give me all the coefficients which I want for my evaluation of the x coordinate. A similar process can also be set up to evaluate all the coordinates for the y coefficients as well. I can do that. Okay. So this is a simple way or a cubic polynomial methodology where I'm matching not only velocities but also accelerations at the intermediate points and I'm specifying the acceleration or velocities at the end points and I'm generating a smooth trajectory between different waypoints that are specified. Okay, now if I choose any intermediate point and if I want to find out what is the precise position of that point, I can precisely pinpoint it and get it from this interpolating polynomial. Okay, next time we will see what happens to the speed. So, so far we have talked about the positions, but how do, how does that affect the desired speed? Can I have a control over the desired speed as well? And can that be independent of what is happening with the position? That's what we will see next time. Okay, that's what we'll discuss in the next class. Any questions so far? All right, let me stop recording in that case.